Chapter 11 of The Sun and Moon and the Hiding of Valinor After Melkor and Ungoliant leave Amon, and the Noldor are on their way to leaving as well, the Valar have been sitting in silent thought in the Ring of Doom, grieving at the loss of the trees and Melkor's corruption of Feanor. And Manwe actually weeps when he hears about Feanor's angry response to his herald, and his insistence that the Noldor continue on their quest. This is because Melkor's marring of Feanor was one of his most evil deeds. The Valar think, they think about what could have been had Feanor never been corrupted. For Feanor was made the mightiest in all parts of body and mind. In valor, in endurance, in beauty, in understanding, in skill, in strength, and in subtlety alike of all the children of Iluvatar. And a bright flame was in him. Mandos then cryptically mentions that Feanor will come to him very soon. Once the Valar learn that the Noldor are back in Middle-earth, they get going on their plan to fix some of the things that Melkor messed up. Yavanna manages to extract one final silver flower from Telperion and a gold fruit from Laurelin. She then gives the flower and fruit to Aule, and Manwe hallows them. Then Aule makes two vessels to carry them, and they are given to Varda so that she can place them in the sky. She then gives them an appointed course across the sky, from west to east, and back again every day. These are the sun and moon, and by making them, the Valar are able to ensure that the entire world, and not just Amon, will be illuminated. This way, the sun can keep the servants of Morgoth at bay without making it necessary for the Valar to fight him again anytime soon. Manwe knows that the race of men will soon wake up. He just doesn't know exactly when or where. And he doesn't want there to be another big cataclysmic battle between Morgoth and the Valar like there was during the siege of Utumno, because it might harm men more than elves because their bodies are weaker. The Maya Aryan is chosen to steer the sunship, and the Maya Tilion steers the island of the moon. Arien is female and Tilion is male. This is a direct nod to Germanic mythology, where the sun is viewed as feminine and the moon is seen as masculine. Arien is mightier than Tilion, being a spirit of fire from the beginning of time, but the moon rises first which actually coincides with when Fingolfin and his host arrive on the shores of Middle-earth. Like, just as they arrive, the moon rises. And it travels from west to east, back and forth across the sky seven times. And when it's in the farthest east, on the seventh time, that's when the sun rises for the first time, also in the west. Morgoth, needless to say, does not like the sun. So he withdraws his servants and goes down in deep into the depths of Angband to hide from the brightness. Varda originally wants the sun and moon to take turns with one rising in the west, going east, and the other one following, so they're both in the sky all the time. Uh, this way, when they cross paths in the middle, their lights would mingle, kind of like how the light of the two trees mingled. However, this situation doesn't last long because, one, Tilion is not a steady driver. He always tries to get close to Aryan because he's drawn to her splendor. But he occasionally gets burned by her. And two, Lorien and Este say that with constant daylight, like no darkness whatsoever, <laughs> there's no rest for anyone in their gardens, and no one can see the stars. So, Varda changes the course of the sun and moon. Now the sun rises in the east, rests in the west, and goes under the earth to pop back up out in the east again. The moon is sent on much the same path, just at a different time, obviously. And it also, of course, goes on a less steady path than the sun. The light of the sun is fairer in the Undying Lands than it is in Middle-earth, because that's where it rests right before it goes back under the earth. Morgoth despises the sun and moon, so he attacks Tilion, sending up spirits of shadow against him. But Tilion is victorious, 
And Morgoth does not dare attack Aryan because he just ha- he just doesn't have the same strength and power that he used to. For as he grew in malice and sent forth from himself the evil that he conceived in lies and creatures of wickedness, his might passed into them and was dispersed, and he himself became ever more bound to the earth, unwilling to issue from his dark strongholds. So Morgoth does not have the same strength as when he knocked over the lamps. He is not that kind of om- omnipotent and powerful. He can't just jump up into the sky to take down the sun and moon himself. And now Angband is totally covered in shadows and fumes to try to protect Morgoth and his servants from the light of the sun. As I mentioned earlier, the Valar do not want to wage open war on Morgoth. However, they don't want him to possibly attack Valinor, so they raise the Pelori Mountains up even higher than they were before, east, north, and south, and the sides of the mountains that face outward become steep and very smooth. They're impossible to climb from the outside. Sentinels are posted throughout the mountains, as well as in the Kalakiria Pass, which is basically the only opening to Valinor from the outside. The Valar also set up the Enchanted Isles, an archipelago stretching from north to south, kind of around Tol Eresea. Uh, Anyone who sails near them becomes confused and bewildered. It's kind of like the Bermuda Triangle, I guess. So with these mysterious islands and the newly tall mountains, Amon is shut to the Noldor in exile. 